Welcome to Voice for Values. I'm Martin Isles. Last week, I introduced you to Walt Heyer, one of the first people in the world to be diagnosed with gender dysphoria and undergo a gender reassignment surgery. Although the transgender agenda is increasingly promoted by politicians, schools and academics, Walt has a very different view. He spoke last week of his difficult journey into transgender regret and ultimately a process of detransitioning to live once again as a man. He has lived the transgender life. He has helped countless others through his transgender regret counselling ministry. His experience is enormous and his insights are compelling. In particular, because his experience began as a child, Walt has a lot to say about the impact of gender ideology on our kids. This week, he and ACL Director of Research Dr Elizabeth Taylor zero in on the dangers of indoctrinating children and their parents into the gender agenda. Walt, you were talking to us last week about um, the transgender movement, how uh, an ideology is being introduced to children and imposed on children, and this idea of transgenderism being sold to children, um, that this isn't an idea that children come to themselves, this is something that's introduced to them by the adult world. And one of the phrases that you left with was that they are manufacturing transgender adults by introducing children to these ideas. Can you tell me who would want... My understanding is that living a transgender life is very distressing and it's very difficult because you're continually having to maintain a, a facade of being something that you're not and that that in itself is a difficult thing. So if a transgender life is a difficult life, why would we want to encourage people into it? Well, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who believe deep down in their heart that they're helping their children. But if we're not manufacturing them. Let's go back four or five years. How many transgender kids were there? If very few, yeah. Yeah. If you go back 10 years, you can't even find one. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So if we haven't been manufacturing them, let's go back and just chart through the years when you saw your first transgender kid in school. The only time they've been uh, fostering this juggernaut of transgender kids is through the indoctrination and affirmation and grooming kids toward changing genders. So adults, in fact, are manufacturing transgender kids who otherwise would not be if we didn't affirm, groom, and help them in that direction. So are they well-meaning but misguided? Um, that's probably the kind thing you could say. I, I know some parents who, and, and I'm, I'm shocked and disheartened myself because I looked on the internet, and if you look up um, transitioning, you're just sort of overwhelmed by the uh, returns on Google of how to affirm your child in a transgender identity. And there's, there's nothing else. It's just here are the key stages and this is how you go about it and this is why it's so important and a wonderful thing. So I can really sympathise with parents who are faced with this um, and they're ex a lot of professionals that they trust explain to them that, no, this is the, in the best interest of their child, that these are the um, protocols that they must observe. And unless you know to Google detransitioning or sex change regret or um, gender critical, mm -hmm. unless you know those terms, then you won't come up with any Google searches that say that there's another way or that this... So I think one of the things that's overwhelming is everybody's suddenly uh, singing off the hymn sheet and you walk into this kind of wall of sound where everyone agrees the only thing to do is to affirm this um, transgender identity for a child as though that's a fixed property of the child's identity. And yet we know from what you were saying that most of those children, if they're allowed to go through puberty normally, will come out of the other side of puberty um, feel, feeling um, you know, relaxed in their own body and, and comfortable being a boy or a girl. Yeah. Well, I think <clears throat> what we have, we're fostering this um, whole transgender thing because uh, we, there's a website called Fourth Way Now, I believe. Mm. It's Fourth Wave Now. Yes. And, and it has primarily younger people, some older people posting mm. on there. But there was uh, Nor, was her Nor Gentry, who was uh, transitioned at 11, came back at 14, and wrote a great piece on this saying that the whole transgender thing is pretty much nonsense. She detransitioned back to the girl she was and stopped being the boy. And she had some excellent ways of putting this whole thing about how she wanted to be a boy to be protected. She felt stronger that she was in better control, but she realized that all kids have difficulty with their body image, mm -hmm. but to not take on a transgender identity. This is from a 14-year-old wow. who's saying, don't do this. Yeah. 
And so right now, it's become a contagious behavior. Mm, We've yes. developed a contagion of transgender identities that's affirmed and pushed by our governments. And schools, safe schools are the unsafe schools. I'm so sorry that we've gotten down this pathway because what I'm wondering now is, are the governments gonna be willing to pay for the detransitions and for the psychotherapy that these young people are gonna need when they have regret and when they're attempting suicide, they have deeper depression and they're in mental hospitals. Who's gonna help them then? Yes, no, I, I have um, explained this problem to uh, a group of lawyers who were literally rubbing their hands and saying the words class action. Oh. But it's going to be 10 years down the line. Exactly. And uh, meanwhile, how much human suffering is there between between now and then? But I think one of the things that's extraordinary is that um, teachers, uh, politicians, um, the, the, the education department policies, um, the medical profession, including uh, psychologists and gender specialists, all of these people that we would expect to have the best interests of children at heart um, are all saying the, the one thing. And if you want to find somebody who speaks on the other side and who uh, counsels caution on this, well, they have a very difficult time speaking up about it. We, we um, have been fortunate at ACL to be in contact with uh, Professor John Whitehall, who's a paediatrician, and he, like you, was saying that 50 years ago, he consulted with a number of his paediatrician friends, and he said between us we had about 900 years of uh, experience, and we'd come across maybe 12 children in that time. And yeah. in almost all of those cases, there was some severe abuse. Yes. Or mental comorbidities. There were, yes. there were other factors um, at work there. And yet, um, you know, his message certainly hasn't been picked up by the media and broadcast everywhere as the good news for, for parents that, by the way, this is not something that you probably need to worry about. Um, and rather, he's had his appointment at the university questioned. You know, sure. Should this man really be speaking on a subject in which he's not an expert? Well, he's a paediatrician with 50 years experience, but he's not a gender expert. Mm -hmm. So how is it that the gender experts have suddenly um, uh, gained such influence? Well, they're being pushed, persuaded and legally threatened if they don't toe the line. So people have actually no choice when they're pressured by their government to follow these rigid guidelines. Mm. I say if we open up the guidelines and let people detransition or let people object openly to this and not push these agendas, not allow kids to change genders in school. Schools are for reading, writing, arithmetic, mm. and education, not for changing genders. We have totally misused our schools. We no longer allow parents to parent. We yeah. have now the government doing the parenting. I just want to know, is the government willing to assume all the responsibility for the suicides and deaths that this horrible process is going to cause them 10 and 15 and 20 years from now? That's yeah. a big question. No one's willing to answer, I'm afraid. No, that's right. And, and the way you put it is uh, there is abuse going on. And yeah, they absolutely. would say that it's abusive to not affirm a transgender identity and you're saying very clearly that it's abusive to do that absolutely because we're we're starting things like body dysmorphic disorder dissociative disorder schizophrenia bipolar disorder anxiety and depression which are key components with this and yet we say there's no mental disorder well i'm sorry depression is a mental disorder mm. ladies and gentlemen that needs to be treated absent of hormone therapy and should be done by a good psychiatric doctor or therapist and helping them through. They may need medication so that they don't run down and commit suicide, although 50% of them apparently are attempting to do so. That's just shocking. Well, thank you very much, Walter. We'll come back in just a moment. Voice for Values at acl.org.au. Okay, so just to pick up, um, Walter, on what you were saying a moment ago about um, the, the, the rate of suicide and the mental disorders, because I understand that there are a lot of mental comorbidities. So one of the things that's interesting is that we all seem to agree that these children are suffering, that mm -hmm. their mental outcomes are, are, are lower mm -hmm. than for other children who don't have mm -hmm. transgenderism. Now, the argument has been made by the um, transgender advocates that the reason for that is um, stigma that uh, we, we need to change society because there's nothing wrong with being transgender. It's just like having red hair or um, it happens all the time in, and, and there are various different theories about how that might 
happen. Uh, I know some people think that we're all transgender to some extent, in which case the whole business loses its meaning, doesn't it? Because all that says is that we all express our gender in different ways, which I think is fine, um, as long as we understand that, you know, this is a man and this is a woman and men and women can do and express themselves and do whatever they like, but this doesn't change who they really are, the, the, the biological reality. But what we're being told now is that um, teenagers who uh, are suicidal, um, that that's because society is insufficiently affirming of them, and particularly parents. And what I've seen this in America and a few cases here in Australia where the doctors get hold of these, these um, children and they're absolutely persuaded that they have the right answer and the mm -hmm. right answer is for this child to transition. Mm -hmm. And that if there's a parent who says, do you know what, I'd just like to hold off on the puberty blockers or the cross-sex hormones, mm -hmm. Um, I think we should exercise just cautious waiting. Let's just wait. Uh, give you the cross-sex hormones. It's because they're transphobic. They mm -hmm. don't love you for who you really are and that they actually hate transgender people more than they love you. Mm -hmm. And that's a heartbreaking lie to tell to a child. And it's also mm -hmm. not true. I know these parents and they'll do anything to um, help their child, particularly th the main thing that they're worried about is that their child doesn't kill themselves. So they will even go along with, okay, we'll affirm you in, a, in another identity. But that's a, a, a tragic thing to introduce to the child. So it seems to me that there's two lies going on. One is that there is an essential you which is different to your body. And the, the, and the other is that... Um, if people don't go along with this agenda, it's because they don't love you. And it seems to me that it's tapping into essential human needs. We need to be known for who we are mm -hmm. and loved anyway. Yeah. Uh, and and that, that's what's been denied to these kids in this process. Well, it's been if twisted. You, yeah, if you have a parent who wants to affirm the child in who they really are, then they're at odds with the people who don't want them to be who they really are, which are these people who are transgender advocates because they want to see all these different behaviors. The truth is suicides and suicide attempts are the direct cause, not of society, not of anybody's lack of affirmation. It's because of depression. Every transgender child who is trying to be affirmed in someone who they aren't, um, this is why they become depressed. When, <clears throat> when a child knows who they are and they go, well, why is somebody trying to change me? There must be something wrong with who I am. Mm. And so, oh, that's kind of, I'm looking at who I, who I really am. They want me to be somebody who I'm really not. That's kind of depressing. The other thing is that psychologically healthy, psychologically, emotionally, and sound children don't attempt suicide. Children who are happy with their gender, People are happy with their environment, are happy children, aren't trying to end their life. It's because they're deeply distressed by being told and affirmed in someone who they're not. Mm. So we really need to think about this. It's, it's totally the opposite of what they're trying to tell you. Yes. It's just flip sides. Yes. Our safe schools are unsafe, and we're trying to affirm people in who they're really not, not who they really are. So everything is upside down and backwards, and that's the way people want to do it today, <coughs> sadly. That's just extraordinary. It, it, it's uh, one, one of the lines that I remember from one of your articles was that we're um, conducting an experiment uh, on, on a whole generation of kids, and we've got no idea how this will end. But um, the indications are that it's not going to end well. So how can we... Oh, I, I think one of the staggering things is that this has just got through and it's been railroaded through policy. So we even have, we know that Ros Ward has transitioned 100 kids in schools. We know that the Victorian government has a policy whereby schools can transition a child without parental knowledge or consent, without con consulting a doctor. And the same in South Australia. In New South Wales, the education department says that parents who don't affirm a transgender identity may be considered a risk of abuse and uh, teachers need to consider their mandatory reporting obligations. So this apparatus, and we, we also know that the um, opposition party um, at federal level has a policy of uh, acknowledging that this will be abuse if parents do not affirm a transgender identity for their child, even though we know that that's a, a, a road that has terrible medical consequences for mm. a child. You would want, from compassion, to uh, help that child avoid that road, if at all possible, and yet parents who want to stand in the way of that will now be considered abusive. It just seems to me extraordinary that the, uh, the strong arming of the law um, to make sure that people can transition, can identify with any gender other than their biological one, um, safely, and, and, but can't come back, and that people who want to help them come back... Uh, 
uh, are now being criminalised. Can you um, talk a little bit about how that's playing out overseas? Well, <clears throat> again, what we know is that uh, when we're, we've continued to affirm people, we've got some history now. These affirmations, this program has done nothing to reduce suicide attempts and suicides for any age group. Mm -hmm. Still, the older people, age 25 and above, are still attempting suicide at a rate of over 40 percent. So we know this is not any other, quote, medically necessary affirmation procedure mm -hmm. that would get a 40 percent attempted suicide rate or with young people, 50 percent attempted suicide rate would immediately be abolished Yep, as absolute quackery. Yes. <laughs> and so we've allowed this quackery freedom to move forward. And so when, when we're telling people they're not who they are and then affirming them that, that is abuse. So again, when we say not affirming them as abuse, the truth is by affirming them, we're abusing them. Mm -hmm. So again, anything you hear from that whole advocate side, turn it around mm -hmm. because the truth is on the other side than what they're saying. Right. Wow. And in, in uh, Chile, you were telling me before that they have laws against mm. people detransitioning now. Yes. They, they've had laws in place where once you transition, it's against the law to detransition back. So I was there to speak to this to the people who uh, don't understand that you can detransition back and to try to help them understand that there's going to be suffering. People, we have hundreds of thousands of people detransitioning back. Today, one of the biggest movements in this whole, quote, transgender movement is detransitioning, regret. You know, people have found that they don't have to commit suicide. They can just detransition. Mm -hmm. And there are many websites now. Mine happened to be the first one. Now they're popping up all over. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so uh, there's people out there helping people and letting them know that you don't need to stay in this complete nonsense transgender identity, mm -hmm. which is really a behavior. It's not an identity. Mm -hmm. And so once you find out that it was nonsense, you feel the pain of having gone through it, you had your fun and the party's over. Hmm. Now you got a hangover, what I call a transgender hangover. It's time to sober up and get your life back and find out and re reassume who you really are and stop playing the nonsense of a transgender identity. I bet that's not landing well with the advocates for the other side. Well, uh, it's not landing well with the people who live the life. Uh, it's not landing well with the people who are under gravestones who committed suicide yeah. because no one was there to help them. I'm here to save lives. People understand that who are on the side of coming out, and they understand that when they come out the other side, they need help. Mm. And I'm the one with the compassion helping them yeah. and are disturbed by the fact that we're trying to affirm people in a gender and an identity of which they're not just to further some big agenda yeah. that has absolutely... Uh, nothing uh, but a political basis to it. There's no, it's total medical nonsense. Yeah. We're so grateful to you, Walter, for coming to Australia and sharing your message with us and particularly someone from your experience and your background and your obviously deep knowledge of the subject. And we thank you so much for sharing your wisdom with us and God bless you while you're here. My pleasure. Thank you. Voice for Values from the Australian Christian Lobby at acl.org.au.